Good morning, everybody. My name is Lizzie Sordia, creator of Angel Men Today, and welcome to the first episode, uh, hopefully one of many, with my very good friend, Sybil Craft Bellamy. And what we want to do is have a Saturday morning coffee conversation with the both of us. So I have my coffee. Sybil, show me yours. Yeah. <laughs> And what we'd like to do today is just have a conversation between two moms. Uh, as many of you know, um, my son Nathan was diagnosed with Angelman syndrome, and Sybil is the mom of Max, who is 15 years old, and he also was diagnosed with Angelman syndrome. So we just wanted to come together and have a Saturday morning conversation. Um, this this episode is going to be in honor of the upcoming November, which is Epilepsy Awareness Month. And if you don't know, uh, most of the individuals with Angelman syndrome are also diagnosed with epilepsy. And uh, both my son and Sybil's son, Max, have also uh, been diagnosed with epilepsy. And so we want to talk a little bit about that. So let me introduce to you my very good friend, Sybil Bellamy. She is, like I said, the mom to Max, 15 years old, adorable boy, turning into a young man. And um, she's also in the final stages of completing her medical dietary degree. There is a comic book coming out, so we'll tell us about that. And her website, which will be published very soon, we'll send you the links to that as soon as it is available. So Sybil, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Liz. Now, thank you to uh, organizing and um, um, setting up this meeting. It's, it's, it's really great. It's a great idea. Yeah, Sybil is from New York, the New York area, and I am in sunny Florida. So uh, it's great that we have this technology. We can do that. And um, so, yeah, we wanted to come together and talk a little bit about epilepsy. Now, Sybil, you are an amazing woman, and the progress that Max has made has been nothing short of miraculous. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about kind of your journey, how it all started? Because it didn't start out so wonderful and roses. Um, tell us a little bit about where you guys started from and how you got to where you are today. Okay. Well, uh, Max was born preemie. Uh, it was not, uh, I, I don't believe it was related to Angelman syndrome, but uh, mostly to September 11, because my husband was working in Ground Zero. And um, when he was born, he immediately showed some uh, respiratory distress. So he was put on oxygen uh, and uh, for um, a couple of days and after he was released. And um, he started having, in regular basis, pneumonia or respiratory distress that we could not really explain. And he was uh, put on oxygen for his first um, seven months of life until he had uh, uh, a thoracic uh, surgery. They had to do what we call a diaphragm placation, which means they fixed his uh, diaphragm uh, to be sure that the diaphragm was working properly because at that time he was doing the opposite job, which means it was collapsing his lung, which explained why Max was uh, not able to breathe without oxygen. So it was a very difficult time because obviously his general development was very slow um, physic, physical development, but we can, we could see that even is like, um, his, uh, attention and behavior toward us was not what we would expect from a baby. And he looked most of the time pretty anxious, uh, pretty worried, scared. He was smiling, but not that much. And um, most of it, again, his development was extremely um, abnormal. Um, Max has another older brother, so I could see that the development was not normal. And um, we did visit many, like all of us, uh, neurologists, and he had a brain scanner, uh, brain MRI. It didn't show anything abnormal except uh, an abnormal, uh, except a uh, um, a gray area matter who was uh, s smaller than what should be at this age. And in fact, it's going to be the trigger for me to start to understand how I could help him 
to grow faster and in a more um, effective way. And for me, the only way I could do this would be to give him a more powerful nutrition so he could use that like a new fuel to grow faster and try to catch up what he didn't have before. Now, um, is this something that you just had a mother's intuition about or was there any doctors that had suggested this? I didn't have any doctor who suggested. It was me and my mom. And in fact, I stopped looking for information and I stopped, I, I was in contact at that point with a, a neurologist in Canada who started telling me to insist on giving him fats, a lot of good LC fats. And on the same time, I had my mother who had this old fashioned European education who was telling me that a child like him should never, ever, ever have sugar. That sugar was poison in the first place, but for a kid like him, he should never have sugar. And between this both information I, that I follow very carefully, Maxwell was the pretty uh, low in carb and pretty high in fat since that time. But I didn't know exactly in which direction I would have to go later on to adjust his meal. So um, fast forward very briefly, finally at 18 months he's being diagnosed. The diagnosis is very clear. When we came back to the genetic team, they told me that when they saw me entering in a room, as you can see, I'm not really blonde with blue eyes. Max, uh, being a baby, was really blonde, and his blue eyes are still the same, They're extremely blue, and his skin was very white. So obviously, me carrying him, it was a pretty like, like a contrast, if I can say that. And for them, when they saw me entering in a room, he did that um, very often in social environments, this big smile, his both arms were uplifted, and um, the, his phenotype was very like uh, a very strong indicator for them about Angelman syndrome. So I think the test came back very quickly, and um, they called us and they asked us to meet them, and like everybody who has Angelman syndrome, you know this process. And uh, here we go, Max has Angelman syndrome. So because we are awareness epilepsy months, um, obviously the first thing they told us about Max was, you will have epilepsy. It will be a very difficult epilepsy to control. Um, a pharmacoresistant epilepsy, which means that even with many medication, we will have problems to control the epilepsy. That's the first thing they told us. Um, after that, they went to different aspects about his development, his cognitive development, his physical development. Uh, that was the second thing they told us that he may never walk. Um, and after that, that they just give us many other non very enthusiastic news about what will be the future with Max. Mm -hmm. um, so I still continue to do what I was doing with him, uh, diet was, and he was starting with early intervention and start physical therapy, speech therapy, and um, PT, OT, and speech therapy. Mm -hmm. So now things was, it was like 14 years ago. Now I know that at that time, when we have a child being diagnosed with this kind of syndrome or with this kind of neurological disorder, I should have received at that time dietary nutritional guidance. And that's the project we are working on right now to bring attention that a child who is being diagnosed with a medical, a severe medical condition or a syndrome the same way they receive um, therapy, regular therapy that we all know, they should have nutritional therapy. Somebody should come in the parent's house and give them a first input about what should be um, given in priority and what should be avoided. Mm -hmm. And I wish I had that. And I wish many of our children would have this help. Right, or at least be available, readily available at the hospitals to provide adequate services. Yes, and being informed. Just let us know that there is some uh, therapy and treatment who will help. And we know the same way that physical therapy help, the same way different therapy 
we know they, they, they are successful and they are working very well, we should have nutritional therapy mm -hmm. guidance. When we use the term refractory or medically intractable epilepsy, it means that seizures, they haven't really responded to medications. So previously it would be a child would have or a person would have refractory epilepsy if they'd been on every single medication known to mankind that could be effective for treating seizures. Um, now the epilepsy community would really like to urge people to consider using the concept or at least thinking of the possibility of refractory epilepsy if an individual with seizures uh, has been on two medications that are appropriate for that type of seizure um, but have not been effective. Uh, and the reason the epilepsy community thinks that we should consider thinking about refractory epilepsy earlier is um, we know that for many children and many adults with epilepsy, medications won't work. Uh, and if the medications aren't working, uh, we really owe it to that person to think of other treatment options, including dietary therapy. We have used it in some children as a first-line therapy. Um, typically, those are families, in families, who they either have had bad experiences with medications, either for that child or other people in the family, uh, or families that are just very anti-medication. Um, and many people view the diet as more natural since it's just modifying what you eat. The first study that was conducted by Dr. Ron Tiber, Elizabeth Teal, and Heidi Pfeiffer, what year did that come out? Uh, I think it was 2007, 2007, 2006. Right. I'm not sure, but I think that's what it is, which was a long time ago. I mean, now I think about it. Right, and see, Nathan is a little bit younger than Max. Nathan is now eight years old. We got the diagnosis when he was just about two and a half, but we got the epilepsy diagnosis first. And, um, you know, his seizures were so hard to control. Uh, he was on four medications. They wanted to add a fifth medication. And by that time, we had received our Angelman syndrome diagnosis. And at that time, unfortunately, it was not explained how hard, because of the genetic diagnosis, how hard it would be to be able to control these seizures. And unfortunately, the neurologist at the time wanted to add an additional medication, and I refused. I said, you know what, I just don't think that this is the answer. You know, I, I don't believe that chasing the dose is an effective way to treat him because not only are we just chasing a dose, um, now we have to deal with the side effects. And so I started looking a little bit more closely at the medications. And it turned out that some of the medications that Nathan was on, the side effect in, in fact was more seizures. And so I brought this information to our neurologist and she literally said to me, well, do you want more seizures or do you want him to shake from the code? And I thought inside, I said, neither. And at that time, I knew something inside of me, my maternal instinct, whatever you want to call it, I knew that we had reached her capacity for her understanding on treating my son. So I said, you know what? You can't help me. I left the office and I knew she could no longer help me. I needed to find somebody else. And so I was brave enough to understand that and find another doctor. Now, the second doctor helped, but didn't get me to where I am today. But it's okay, and I wanna give my friends that are watching, I wanna give you guys hope, and I wanna give you guys the, the um, strength that if your current neurologist, doctor, whatever your medical team, if they are not helping you, like you go home and you are still suffering, your children are still suffering with seizures, I want to give you the strength to know that you are in the position and you have every right to fire your doctors and get a referral or call and make an appointment. You don't even have to tell your doctors in some cases that you're no longer working with them because in some cases doctors had threatened me with 
referring me to a neurosurgeon. And again, my answer was, no, thank you. That just didn't register with me. I didn't think that that was the answer. And we both know, we both are very good friends with um, the Charlie Foundation. And our friend Charlie had the surgery and it didn't work for him. It didn't work for him. The neurological activity that was causing the seizures just moved to a different part of his brain. And so I want to offer you guys the strength that Sybil and I have to move forward and get the right medical team that supports you and that will work with you because you as the parent, you know what's happening with your child. You and you alone are the ultimate authority for your children. And the doctors are just there to support you. So let's not confuse that role. We don't abide by what they say. They are not the ultimate authority. We as parents, we are because we know what we deal with when we go home. Yep. And so Sybil, tell us um, how over the years, how has that helped Max improve when you started doing the therapy and then later uh, had the ability to meet Dr. Ron Tiber, Elizabeth Teal, and Heidi Pfeiffer. I just want to go back to what you just said about having uh, being brave enough to change neurologists because it's so true. I now I'm thinking about it. I think we saw maybe at least ten neurologists, and you're so right. Except I didn't even I was I was pretty bad in the way that I went to see neurologists and right away I knew if we would be on the same line, like a neurologist who just said you know. He has that. It's very bad. That's the way it is. Just give him medication. That's it. For me, I didn't even think much about it. I was just like, you know what? Forget about it. I'm not going to come back here. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, didn't come back. And TLI found the one, and I found many, in fact, who were very receptive to my desire to do something for him who was different than what is traditionally offered. So I did have a couple of doctors who were very enthusiastic about the diets and the same way they were enthusiastic about other way to help a child who would be chronically sick anyway. I mean, when I say sick, not sick, but who have a chronic, who has a syndrome, he's born with that. So it's not going to disappear in, in one day. So because of that, they could understand that what I was looking for was a new way of living with him, a new way to give him his food, but really appropriate to his syndrome, to it, to, to Max. Right. They were all for it. And um, most of the time, they didn't know much, but they were just smart enough to have the intellectual curiosity to push me and tell me, if you find something, give it to me because I want to look at it because I am interested. I'm agree with you. Mm. This is it's so funny when you say it because now I'm thinking about how many doctors I saw. I don't know, tons. The one who tell you, you know what, you are a worry mom. You're making like things so complete. Before he was diagnosed, I was like, you know what, that's not normal. She's doing this and that. Oh, mother, you're always nervous. You're right. right. Let's talk about the first seizure for you because I know you had a lot more struggle than we had with Max. So. I did, uh, Nathan did. Um, his first seizure started at 15 months old and he was sick. He did have pneumonia. Um, I had never experienced a seizure before. I had never seen anyone have a seizure before. Um, thankfully, you know, my husband is in law enforcement and he knew what was happening. And um, so we rushed to the hospital and they quickly dismissed it as febrile seizures. Despite the fact that our neurologist met us at the hospital, knew that he was developmentally delayed, um, but still at that time didn't have an official diagnosis for us. Uh, they had given me many, let's call them whispers of autism. Um, everyone was afraid to give me that autism diagnosis. Um, so, they dismissed it as a febrile seizure because of his uh, illness. And then we were right back in the hospital um, like the next month. It just seemed like we were having seizures 
almost every month and he was being hospitalized because of them. Um, and then it was on, let's see, I think he was a little over a year now. And we were in the hospital again and they wanted to monitor him. He was hooked up to the EEG and um, the heart monitor, the oxygen monitor, and of course the seizures start and they are one after another, one after another. And this whole team, the medical team, raced into the room. They, they kind of pushed me out of the way and uh, they, everybody filled his bed. And it, I didn't know what was going on other than his seizures wouldn't stop. Um, his heart was racing. A lot of times when they have seizures, the heart race, the heart starts racing. And all of a sudden, the heart, his heart monitor starts alarming because his heart rate was dropping. But I saw the face of the nurse and it was filled with pure terror. Her eyes were large and she had him wrapped in the blanket and she was gently moving him from side to side, his entire body shaking him and saying, stay with me, stay with me. And at that moment, I got goosebumps. And thank God my husband was there because I wanted to fall to the floor. I felt sick. I literally felt so sick. Um, I was afraid at that very moment that we were going to lose him. They moved him to ICU. He was on Ativan, so he was out of it. And he was stable. And I said to my neurologist when he had come in to visit, I said, you know, I'm hearing whispers of this diet called the ketogenic diet. I said, what, what, what do you know about it? And he looked at me and he said, oh, no, he wouldn't be a good candidate for that because that's for kids who are having more than 100 seizures a day. And to me, that, that alarm inside me, my maternal instinct went off right away. And I said, you know what? That's not the right answer. I don't know what the right answer is at this moment, but that's not the right answer. Look at my son. My son is laying there in the hospital, hopped up on Ativan because we can't stop these seizures and we can't try. I don't understand why we can't try a nutritional approach. I don't know what the ketogenic diet is at that time, but why wouldn't that be an option? I mean, 100, and 100 seizures compared to having a child that has to be, you know, on such high doses of Ativan that they are completely immobile. And so it didn't make sense to me at that time. And internally, I knew that that was not the right answer, that no, you can't try the ketogenic diet was not the right answer. What I did know was you are not the right doctor to help me. If you, if you don't know what the right answer is, because obviously my son is, is there unconscious and you can't control his seizures and you don't know what the answer is, but you're not willing to explore or learn more, then obviously you're not the right doctor to help me. And so that was the last time I saw that doctor. I knew then that he was not gonna be on my team to help get my son better. So I had no problems finding somebody else that would. Wow. And um, you know, I didn't know what the ketogenic diet was at the time. I had just been hearing whispers. I didn't even know you, Sybil, at that time when, when this was happening. And um, I, didn't even, I didn't know about the study that had been done. Nathan was born in 2008. And I, even after getting the Angelman syndrome diagnosis, I still had not, that information of the low glycemic index diet had not come to me. Nobody made me aware of it. I didn't, I didn't really know anybody. Um, I wasn't connected on to Facebook and the Facebook groups and know all the people that I know now. And so at that time, um, there was no way for me to know, but I think that doctors should know. Doctors should stay informed on the latest treatments that are working. And when we have the medical proof, the scientific evidence in a diet, like the low glycemic index treatment that has proven in specifically children with Angelman syndrome to have a success rate of over 90%. 
you should receive your diagnosis and at the end just saying like let me go. that that would be wonderful if it went hand in hand if you received an angelman syndrome diagnosis and then you were made aware of the effective treatments because there is only one there is only one treatment for angelman syndrome today which is the low glycemic index treatment and with statistics like 90% improvement with either improving seizure activity control or even stopping seizures altogether. There is no medication on the market that can compare to that. Yeah, the recovery time, if a seizure happens, is better. Uh, the length of the seizure is shorter. And uh, just to extend it a tiny bit about the diet, it's not limited to the epilepsy. It goes to help the general physical cognitive development, uh, behavior development, which is absolutely huge. Uh, Max is turning now 15, he's being a teenager, and we, sh we saw for the first time the boys, like the young adults coming out when he's not happy now. It was a big surprise this month to see he was putting in a car I mean, in his um, transportation to go at school. And unfortunately, they changed, I think, eight times the driver, the kind of bus and the aid. And at the eight time, he literally, like, just showed the most uh, physical way that he was not happy to have systematically a new driver, a new aid, and he just destroyed the car. Mm. It just grabbed the ceiling and just took the ceiling down. It was pretty oh, bad. Wow. Yeah. So anyway, we just see that his, his behavior is changing. And it's pretty weird because when I call, obviously, pediatrician, or just everybody's informed about this new change that I never saw before, everybody was clapping. It was like, wonderful. That's great. That means that there is normal evolution. So I was just like, okay, that's, that's maybe wonderful, but I want to be sure this is being controlled. So we are refocusing and fine-tuning his diet right now. I saw a positive effect in like 48 hours just by readjusting his diet. Yeah. Wow. So now, Incredible. well, there's another thing on the side, obviously. He's more prepared. Now we have the same driver and the same aid. He's not exactly, it's not the setting which, is, which he likes the most, but this is the way it is. So we try to work on that part. But his behavior is back to his normal. And um, to change the diet, we talk about it, what we could modify, what we could supplement him, and we see the effect. And that's... That's amazing because at one point I was wondering, I was really worried that because his behavior, his hormone, his metabolism is changing. I was really worried that seizure may come back because Max didn't have seizure for years now. He's not taking any medication. And I get really worried for that. So that's why we are readjusting the diet. And that's the amazing thing with the diet. There is, I mean, infinity way to modify the diet. For everybody, we can personalize the diet for every single child, patient, all the time. We can change it every year, every month. I mean, whatever. It can be appropriate to the child behavior, medical, if he's getting sick, if he's getting tired, all of this. We can adapt every single time, which is really amazing. And it's so effective. Right. And that's absolutely wonderful because... We are not all the same. Even though our children may have the same genetic diagnosis, they are not the same. No, no. Max is different than Nathan. Just look at them. <laughs> right, right. And so they're both on high-fat, low-carb diets, yes. However, they are on different versions of them. They eat different things because yep. their bodies are different. Exactly. And that's why they are not like, uh, you cannot think that there's one diet for everybody. Right. The same base for everybody, because we want to be sure that there is no processed food, not high carbs. We agree for all of that. But after that, 
each child has his strengths and each child has his weakness. So we have to look what is happening there. And um, in fact, just by empirical observation, we can see what is good for them, what is not good for them. And you just adjust, adjust and going in that direction. And that's, that's wonderful. Right. When you don't understand their nutritional deficiencies, when you do not understand yeah. their allergies, sensitivities, yeah. you know, and you're just eating from a food list, it's not really customized, and therefore you can't really determine the, the, uh, the effectiveness of the so-called diet. That's why we have to do lab quite often. That's, that's unfortunate, but I know as a patient, you have to do it anyway. So I'd rather to do it to be sure that he's not in deficiency and help him to extra vitamin, mineral, or whatever. Um, but it, it has to be monitored. All right, guys, we are back. Motherly duties called. <laughs> so we had to take a break for a moment, but we are back. And um, before we wrap it up today, uh, well, Sybil, can you tell us a little bit about um, the trend initiative that we are both a part of. So the trend initiative is, I think, the best opportunity that everybody should have and should try. Um, it's it's going to be like, I mean, it is a group of some of the best people right now with the best knowledge in nutritional therapy with a great support, uh, network support, um, medical support, phone, phone call to, um, to let you try the diet. Wherever you are geographically, we had people who were coming from the UK, from Australia, everybody can join it. You're gonna learn how to start the diet, how to manage the diet, what to look for um, in positive, and maybe some specific side effects. We we just gonna we just want you to give it a try. You you will have the opportunity to discover something that you may don't know, that you may be worried or afraid, afraid or scared, or you just feel that. You, you don't have the, the proper guidance and knowledge to do it, this is the time. This is really the best opportunity ever. It's parents with children with medical condition. We're getting fed up to have this, like you said, like whisper that this, this conversation of people saying about something, but they didn't know much more about it. And after they realized after a while that it was positive, it was powerful enough to change their life, which are what we're looking for, to have a better quality of life for us and for children. Right. And this is really the best opportunity ever we can do. This is free. You join it free. So you will have full support free from your house, which is great. But this is just an incredible opportunity um, for everyone to learn about the diet and help get control of the seizures. Um, one thing that we didn't mention that I wanted to talk about briefly is that another thing that I didn't understand initially was that his seizures were life-threatening. And not at that time, not before, and not since had it ever been discussed with me that epilepsy in Angelin syndrome is this serious. It is life-threatening. So I do not take seizures lightly. Sybil does not take seizures lightly. I mean, even the slightest eye flutter will make my heart drop. You know, if I, if I see Nathan and Sybil is the same way, if, you know, we're always monitoring our children's eyes, we're looking for activity, mouth smacking, whatever, we are on high alert with our children. Um, because we know the severity of it. And so that's something we don't take lightly for our kids. And even one seizure is too many for them. So that's why you'll see Sybil and I advocating so strongly for this because we've seen how it has changed both of our lives and how our children are benefiting from it. Um, so we wanna share that with you. And I will post the links below of the diet initiative, the trend diet initiative I will post. Um, Sybil's link, if you didn't know, Sybil has a Facebook page called the Angelman Syndrome Ketogenic Diet where she offers her delicious recipes 
and she talks about the healthy fats that you can start incorporating into your child's diet now. Um, you know, and this is just so amazing because this is something that is available for, to our children today. You know, when we, when we were stuck in those situations, our kids were in and out of the hospital, I needed something today. They don't have time to wait. I'm not waiting for anybody. Um, you know, whatever they're doing in the lab is fantastic and it's great. And maybe, you know, one day we'll see how it transitions to children. However, um, I don't have time for that. And Sybil didn't have time for that. We need to help our children today because they're only getting older. Their lives are being affected. So we want to invite you guys to that. Sybil, is there anything else you'd like to, to say? Oh, let me show you my shirt. <laughs> Mom warrior? No, I am a mom warrior. <laughs> it's not always been easy and it is not fun, but um, you know, we advocate very strongly for our children and we do everything that we can and we want to help you guys do the same and get you the information that you need so that you can also do the same and, and benefit with your daily life and the health and well-being of your children. And it is accessible again from your kitchen, which is like just amazing. It's yeah. a great feeling. And not only that, but when you're going to see your child becoming healthier and stronger and just feeling better, it will be just because of you, which is the most rewarding things ever. Just to know that when you're going to go see your doctor, your neurologist, he's going to walk in or you're going to be there. And during the auscultation, they're going to say, wow, he's really doing good. That's just because of you. And that's the most rewarding thing ever for parents. Right. Absolutely. Thank you, Sybil, for joining me today on this Saturday uh, Coffee Combo. And we hope to see you guys on our next Saturday Coffee Combo. And I will give you all the links in the video descriptions and we will talk to you guys very soon. Um, please comment if you have any questions and we'll try to help you with anything that uh, we can do for you. Thank you, Elise. Bye-bye. Have a good weekend. Bye, love. Bye. Bye.